Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our first community town hall, uh, or virtual community town hall, and hopefully we can provide you with some very interesting information as we go through the evening. Uh, first, I have to do some uh, housekeeping items. Uh, in relation to Q&A, uh, you are encouraged to send us your questions. You can submit these at any time. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question there. So again, don't wait till the end. You can send it to us. They'll be recorded and our, our uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Coley, will um, uh, basically go through the questions at the end of the presentation. So the folks that will be joining me this evening, uh, our panelists are Dr. Jane Bonner, uh, who is the ER director of our Mullica Hill and Woodbury facilities, and Dr. Matt Warner, who is the medical director of our ER facilities at Vineland, Elmer, and Bridgeton. And our moderator will be Dr. Coley, and she will direct us through uh, all the question and answers uh, at the end um, of the presentation. Our goal tonight is really a couple things. One, to give you an update as to what's going on, but also to give you a better understanding, and hopefully you'll feel safer by the time we're done tonight than you feel right now. So we'll take you through what's happening, the new events, and also what we're doing at Inspira. From COVID admissions, and as you can see, the bell curve for Inspira uh, is continuing to decrease. Uh, since this started, and our first patient uh, we received in, on March 15th, and that's not very long ago. It seems like forever, but it is not very long ago. And we've had 717 total admissions in that time frame, but throughout our system, we continue to decrease, and that is definitely a positive, because as we pivot away from the COVID uh, census and what we're handling on COVID, we will start um, going back to our elective surgeries and a little bit of normalcy. Nobody knows what normalcy will be, but we'll talk about that a little further. We did a community survey uh, not too long ago, wanting to get your input. And, and uh, some of the things that we heard were that you were a little concerned about uh, coming to the hospital during the pandemic. Uh, you would be less concerned coming to the hospital after. Uh, and you feel uh, a high level of confidence for your local hospital and the caregivers that provide um, the care to you. Now, one of the things we found, that one of the key takeaways, is the interest in telemedicine. Now, we've always, always, we've done telemedicine for quite a while. Uh, and there's always been in some fairly stringent regulations around telemedicine. With the pandemic, those regulations have been uh, eased, and we were able to roll out uh, telemedicine in a much broader fashion. Everyone, uh, from a standpoint of everyone who has used it, thinks it's a positive tool, and we would envision that we would continue to use this even after uh, COVID uh, starts to settle down. And I basically said settle down, I, I'm not sure COVID will ever go away, uh, but from a standpoint of once the vaccines and treatments are more available, I think we'll have a much better control over it. Um, so uh, our goal is to be able to do the type of things that you've asked us to do and so we can make you feel safer when you come to our hospitals. It's safe to seek medical care now. We do not want you to avoid getting treatment because you fear you might get uh, COVID if you come to our, uh, to our hospitals. Uh, one of the things we are noticing, even though our, our community members have told us they're not doing it, but our EMS squads are all seeing that people who should be coming, should be coming to the hospital, should be calling 911, are, are not doing that to the level that they should. And please, please, if I get any point across tonight, please do not uh, always make sure if you're not feeling well, um, 
that you call 911, you come to the hospital. We are here to help you. That's our goal. When we started this, back in our first patient was March 15th, we put together an emergency operations center. The goal of that center is to take care of everything that was happening related to COVID, whether it was reporting to the government, whether it was questions or answers or requirements of things that we needed to our hospital. And I can tell you they have, they have been the center of everything that uh, we've been doing from a standpoint of trying to coordinate what is happening. Uh, just an interesting sidelight. Uh, there's probably 15, 20 people that we have in the emergency operations center. And, and right now our senior team is working at home and they pretty much took our offices. So all, all of our operations center folks are all working out of our offices, our corporate offices at this point in time. But they're doing a magnificent job in keeping us moving forward under all phases of our COVID operation. I think one of the goals and the main goals we want to get across tonight is safety related to our patients, related to our staff, and related to our community. Uh, we have always been here for our community, and it has always been our top priority for what we want to achieve and how we help. Okay, we have taken every precaution that we can take, and you'll see a little bit more of that in a few minutes uh, on all of our campuses. And, and I think the major point that, that we want to get across is is that we have had no, we have had no healthcare acquired COVID cases. Basically what I mean by that is that anybody who came in with a diagnosis of a non-COVID admission left as a non-COVID admission. Nobody got COVID when they were in the hospital, when they were admitted for non-COVID as a non-COVID case. Again, that's very important, okay? So when, if you're concerned that you're gonna come into the hospital, but if you had a heart attack or a stroke or, or a gallbladder or whatever, whatever the reason was, okay, uh, you should not be concerned that um, you have a uh, significant chance to uh, get COVID while you're in the hospital. All the things that we've put in place have helped mitigate that significantly. And, and again, as I said, we'll touch on that. Across our entire system, we cohort patients, and by that I mean we take care of COVID-19 patients completely separate from how we take care of non-COVID-19 uh, patients. Uh, we put them in different locations, and we have different staff that takes care of uh, each of those uh, each of those cohorts. One of the other big things that is important, and I've got uh, negative pressure rooms up on the screen, but the technology that we have in our our Mulca Hill site, which just opened in December, is probably one of the best um, hospitals from a standpoint of technology and flexibility in the state, as well as our Vineland facility. Both of these entities have all private rooms. We have converted a large portion of our beds to negative pressure rooms. You might ask what that is. Well, a negative pressure room is really a specialized isolation room that, that, that provides clean air on an ongoing basis uh, for the patients that are in those rooms. Basically used for those folks who have viruses uh, and need to be isolated. Well, we have the flexibility to do that through over 40% of our rooms throughout uh, the system. So all private rooms and 40% and of those rooms are negative, uh, negative pressure rooms. And again, one of the important things when, when you treat these, uh, these types of patients is the policies that we have in place from everyone wears a mask. You come into our hospital, um, you'll be, if you don't have a mask on, you'll be given a mask. Uh, you'll, be, you'll have your temperature checked. You'll be asked a, a number of questions as to whether, uh, how you're feeling. And, and so we have uh, those policies and we have a large quantity of personal uh, protection equipment, uh, protective equipment. Supplies is, is basically uh, the M95, the N95 masks, uh, either goggles, face masks, gloves, all those types of things. And our supply chain and the people that we have purchasing these uh, are doing a wonderful job uh, as we go forward 
and actually we just um, leased some additional warehouse space and we are stockpiling this, um, uh, all of these PPE supplies just so we have them uh, in case they're needed. Uh, in, in the past, we would, we would uh, order our inventories and use them just in time, as they were called, just as we needed them. We have abandoned that, and now we are stockpiling all the supplies that we may need uh, in the future uh, if, if, this, if this does come back in a bigger way, so we'll be ready. It's one of the, the learned things that we've gone through here. Uh, one of the, uh, in the right-hand corner of the slide, uh, you'll see a UV light uh, disinfectant system. Uh, that UV light goes into every room after someone is discharged. It, it, it basically kills about 99.99% of all the bacteria that's in the room. Um, that's in addition to all the deep uh, uh, cleaning uh, rounds that we do every day. Okay, so all of our rooms are uh, cleaned with UV lights uh, with, for disinfection. They are cleaned uh, multiple times a day for um, from from our housekeeping and our EVS people, and they are sanitized on an ongoing basis. So again, the goal is to keep all of our patients as comfortable and as safe as possible. Some of the things you'll see a little differently when you come into our hospital that you may have not seen uh, in the past. We now have plexiglass shields to, uh, for any face-to-face uh, uh, -face contact in registration, those types of areas, which we did not have before. So that protects, that's protecting the goal here is to protect both our employees and our patients and our community as they come in. Uh, hand washing and sanitation stations throughout the hospital We'll even see that we have social distancing cues and signage, the decals that we have on the floors. Again, the goal is to keep everybody following the rules of what we need to do to stay safe. As many of you may know, uh, Inspira is sort of known for their innovation and their technology um, to the type of things like when hand, sanit uh, hand sanitizers were becoming a real problem for us to be able to get uh, that uh, to get hand sanitizers. Uh, actually, our pharmacy departments uh, started to make uh, hand sanitizers ourselves under, under the rules of working uh, with, we had the government approval to do it, and they are producing about 50% of our need from a hand sanitizing standpoint. Uh, we have wellness programs and, and where we will track you when you go home, uh, whether it's from a COVID discharge or whether we're treating you for diabetes, COPD, whatever your problem may be, we have, actually we have wearables that we give our patients when they go home, and we have a tracking system with, uh, um, uh, we work with a group that under our population health banner that will track you to make sure you're doing okay. If we start seeing you are having a problem, we will contact you immediately and to give you the guidance of where you need to go. And if, if Need be, we will send somebody to get you to take you there. And again, we're using telehealth, as I had mentioned, in a much bigger way now. So it gives you the opportunity to either call us, see us t via uh, telehealth. You can come in to see us. Um, so you have a number of options, or you can call us on 1-800-INSPIRA, and we can always guide you as to how we, um, as to what your needs are. And we've showed you a number of things from a standpoint of all the safety uh, and, and all the precautions we're putting in our hospitals. We are also putting all of those precautions in our ambulatory centers as well. We have about 150 ambulatory centers that run from Atlantic County all the way up to Camden County and everywhere in between. Uh, on all these locations, now not all of them are open at this point in time, but most of them are. And I will tell you probably within the next couple of weeks, We'll be bringing back uh, uh, the, the, the folks that we have furloughed that, we had, th that were in these locations, and we'll be up and running probably in the next month in all of our outpatient locations. That's our goal. But as you can see, uh, the same types of things that we are doing at the hospital, we're doing in all of our ambulatory sites. Our goal is to make uh, every, everywhere you will touch us from a standpoint of throughout our whole system, you'll get that same feeling of safety and to get the best quality care that we can give you. 
Now, at this point in time, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Bonner to go through some of the things that uh, he's seeing in the Mullica Hill ER just to give you a better understanding as to what's going on uh, for the safety of, of as, you could, as you come into our ERs. Jim? Thank you, John, and thank you for joining us. I want to say with confidence to you, you are safe. If you need to come to the emergency department, you are safe. And I say that with confidence because we are safe. I saw our first COVID patient on March 15th. We have lived in this space every day since. Our clinicians and our care team have not gotten sick. And that's not an accident. So let me tell you about some of the processes that have kept us all safe. The, when, you, when you enter the emergency department uh, from the walk-in entrance, you'll be greeted if you don't have a mask, we'll, be, we'll give you a mask. Certainly your temperature will be checked and you'll be placed in a private negative pressure room. We have 38 negative pressure private rooms in the emergency department at Mullica Hill. The feature of negative pressure has a benefit to you that simply means you're breathing clean air. You're not breathing the air of a, of a room or from a room of a different patient who may have a different illness than, than you do. So you're safe and we are safe. And you know, John has spoken about that, but the, the amount of negative pressure private rooms that we have in the Mullica Hill Emergency Department, 38 of those, exceeds what's available throughout South Jersey in that regard. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful feature. This building is magnificent and it has delivered on all of its promise through this pandemic. Uh, a couple of unsung heroes in this safety feature, you know, you've been very good to us as nurses and, and clinicians throughout. You've fed us, you've cheered us, you've fed us so much my sweatpants don't fit any longer. Um, but in keeping us safe, and we thank you for that, by the way, in keeping us safe, the supply chain folks are the, the, the folks who have gotten us the N95 masks, as well as the community donations, which we again appreciate. But the N95 masks were a target. The, the hand sanitizers were an issue. The, uh, the, the face shields, the gowns. There's been an international hunt to compete in a space where everyone needs the same thing. And the supply chain team at Inspira has delivered for us and that has kept us safe. So when we come in to see you and you're a patient, we'll be dressed like a beekeeper. We'll have a hat on, we'll have a, an N95 mask, we may have a surgical mask on top of that, we'll have a face shield, probably a gown and maybe a gown and gloves. Uh, and that's to keep you safe and us safe. Um, and we want you to have confidence in that regard. Um, we're blessed to have this building, we're blessed to have this facility at our disposal and we want you to feel confident that you can come here, be treated, and be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Warner uh, to give us a little bit of the information about our Vine and, and, and Elmer and Bridgeton facilities. Thank you. We're taking similar steps at our Vineland, Elmer, and Bridgeton EDs. We're emphasizing a clean environment we have protective equipment for our patients and our staff. We have plenty of negative pressure rooms as well. And we are also separating our potential COVID patients from our other patients. We wanna emphasize our EDs remain open to safely treat you. We are prepared to care for you. We don't want to put off, we don't want you to put off seeking care out of fear for catching infection. We, many illnesses are time sensitive, such as heart attack and stroke. This past week when I was working in the emergency department, we had two heart attacks back to back. Our team followed the typical processes. Things were handled uh, exceptionally well. The only difference was that we took extra steps to make sure that our patients and staff were protected. So please, we wanna emphasize that we are open and prepared to take great care of you. Thank you, Matt. And again, uh, to emphasize the safety that we've 
uh, that the procedures and, and the steps we are taking, and you can see them as they're listed um, on, the, uh, on the screen. Uh, we are doing that in all of our hospitals. We are doing that in, in all of our uh, ambulatory centers. And again, our goal is to make sure we can take, of, take, take care of our community when they need us. Uh, we've been here for a very long time. Uh, just opened the Mullica Hill, but we were in Woodbury for 100 years. Um, you know, so our goal is to make sure that our community feels safe when they need us and we're here to help. Now you may have heard that the um, governor and the commissioner of health uh, approved us going back to, uh, to start doing elective procedures. Uh, as you may or may not have known, the, the uh, elective procedures were uh, halted by an executive order of the uh, governor. And because there was a concern that we were going to be overrun by COVID, uh, the, the, initial discuss, the, the initial projections when this all started was that we would have enough patients to fill three times the amount of beds that we had available to us just in Gloucester County. Now, with all the work that our community has done in social distancing and washing their hands and staying at home, doing all of those things made a significant difference. And when I showed you in one of my first slides of uh, that bell curve, that bell curve was not anything like what they saw up in North Jersey or Central Jersey, where it just spiked up and came down. Uh, we were able to moderate that down, which was great for our community, great for us being able to take care of you. So now because of that, we feel comfortable and, and the state feels comfortable in the Department of Health in allowing us to go back into the elective procedure uh, realm. And so we are working on a daily basis. We've got a number of teams that are working with our OR teams, our, our pre-admission teams, with our surgeons to try to determine the backlog that they may have and, and how we can address it. So we can work together to make sure that we can get uh, our folks that um, need surgery. And you know, I, I think it's a little bit of a euphemism uh, to say you know, elective surgery can be put off for a long period of time. You know, as, as, as someone who has had their knee replaced, and knee replacement is considered an elective uh, uh, procedure, I can tell you it may be elective to you, but when I needed my knee done, it wasn't very elective to me. Uh, so we will be working, we have started, we have started doing cases on Tuesday. We will be ramping up. We were not just opening the faucet and everybody showing up uh, on Tuesday. Every day we are building, um, uh, building that volume so we can make sure we are doing this in the safest way possible and meeting all the regulations from, um, uh, from the governor. Now, as, as we look at what I like to call Inspira PreCheck, uh, the things that we've talked about, the masks, the temperature checks, the, the, the social distancing and the decals on the floors, all the plexiglass uh, barriers. Uh, and the other thing that we've talked about is the contactless appointments. And, and as many of you know, um, we, we have a lot of information on our portal. You can, you can make your own self, you can make your own appointments. You can do self appointments if you prefer to do that. You can call 1-800-INSPIRA from a standpoint of having our folks help you. Uh, we can do it via telehealth. We can do it face-to-face. -face. So we are giving you all of the um, options that you would like, that you feel safe with and comfortable with in, in, in this process. And we are sort of wrapping it and calling it in spirit pre-check. Um, so again, we will work with you in every way we possibly can. And as I said, in our wearables program, which is our Inspira, uh, Inspira Health, our Health Check program, our Health Plus program. Um, that's our wellness program where we use wearables to help you be able to, to, to measure um, all of your, your metrics. And if we see you're having a problem, we're going to get to you right away and, and get you to where you need to be immediately. So we continue to do this. Uh, we've done this in the past. We are continuing to grow and add additional things so everyone can get a safer feeling when they come to our hospitals. And I've told you all the things that, that we're doing, and, but this doesn't work 
uh, unless you help us. Um, if we're concerned about the safety of our employees, the safety of our visitors and our community, we need you to continue to do what you've been doing. Okay, as I said, when you look at how that curve worked, it only worked the way it did because of the diligence of the people in our community. And, and even though the governor will continue uh, uh, to, to ease the restrictions, please keep in mind, you know, social distancing, wearing the masks when you go out, those types of things, because the, uh, the, the more we can cut back on that positive doubling effect that, that everyone talks about, the better off we're going to be, the less emissions we're going to see, and hopefully the more we will get back, the closer we can get back to, to normalcy um, in, in the near future. Now, and I can tell you, and Jim, Jim has, uh, has mentioned it, but I am utterly amazed uh, and, and very thankful for everything that our community has done for us. And, and we've, we've set up a, um, an emergency response fund, and we've, uh, the community has donated over $110,000. The supply chain things that, that people have, they're just calling up and, and uh, asking what can they do. Uh, our, our chief financial officer came out of his office one day, and there, was, the, there were boxes of masks uh, on his porch. He had no idea who they were from, um, and somebody just wanted to help, and, and they delivered them to him. Um, homemade masks, the food donations, as, as, you know, as we've said earlier. Uh, restaurants just calling us saying, what can I do? How can I help? Where can I go? Um, and, and we thank everyone for all of that help. And just the messages, the, the, the messages of, of gratitude and, and the help that we've been able to provide you, that goes a long way from a standpoint of uh, what our people, uh, our people know uh, that, that our community cares. But when you get that type of message, and, and as you can see from the, uh, one of the pictures there, uh, the drive-by from all of our first responders, uh, that really goes a long way. Uh, our, our first responders and our communities in all the areas we serve have done that. And, and it, is, it is significantly appreciated. And I thank you for that. And the last thing I want to make sure that, that we hit is we, we instituted what we call a, a Blue Hearts for Heroes campaign. And all we asked was that um, you get something that was blue or or paint it blue or do whatever you want and turn, put it into a heart and um, put it on your door, on your window. Um, we just thought it would be a nice thing as the first responders, not just our hospital people, but all the first responders saw that people cared. Well, I can tell you the response to this program, we have thousands of people who are doing this. Uh, you drive by you know, a, a number of neighborhoods, you'll see those hearts up there just saying thank you. And, and, and it is significantly appreciated. Uh, at this point in time, I would like to turn it back to our moderator, Dr. Coley, and hopefully we have some interesting questions that we can address and help you uh, with any, anything you want to know. Okay. Thank you, John. And yes, we have had a lot of questions coming in. So in no particular order, I'll start to ask our panelists some questions and try to answer as many of your questions as we can tonight. Um, I have a feeling we're not going to get to all of them, but I will try to consolidate as many of them as I can. So first question here, um, John, and I think this one bears repeating, although you've mentioned it before. Do you have a count of people who came to the hospital and contracted COVID? Actually, from, uh, uh, and, and I was, um, I want to be very specific about this. Nobody who came to the hospital as a patient uh, that had a non-COVID diagnosis uh, caught COVID when they were in the hospital. Uh, the COVID patients that came to the hospital were treated for COVID. The non-COVID patients were treated for whatever, whatever their diagnosis was. They were segregated from the COVID folks and they left uh, under the diagnosis that they came in under and did not catch COVID when they were in our hospitals. Thank you. Another good question. Do you see volunteer services returning anytime soon? Well, I would like that to happen. Uh, we have to be very careful. Uh, we, we don't have that right now. And I can tell you, our volunteers are some of the most dedicated individuals uh, that I've ever seen. 
and we have thousands of them. And I, when I see them on the street, that's the first question uh, that they ask me. You know, I'm not seeing very many of them on the street right now, but I do see them in the grocery store once in a while. Um, it's like, when can we come back? And, and, and we're being very careful as to how, because they fall under our visitor policy as well. And um, we're not sure uh, when the governor uh, re, uh, uh, brings us back and he removes the, uh, uh, the executive order, we'll consider it, but right now we're not going to do it. Okay. Basically for the safety uh, of our volunteers. Next question. How confident do you feel, John, about your supplies for masks, gowns, and gloves? Uh, I feel very comfortable at this point in time. And, and I can tell you, as, as Dr. Bonner had mentioned, uh, this is a fluid situation. Uh, but we are, continuing, we are continuing to plan for a surge, even though it does not look like we will see one. Uh, but as, as I said, one of the things we have learned over the last couple of months is that the, 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 more stock, the more we can stockpile um, the, the PPE supplies that we need, the better off we'll be. So we will continue to do that, even though we have plenty of supply right now. Great. We have some good clinical questions that I'd like to bring up too. So Dr. Bonner, if my test comes back negative, do I need a second test? As far as we know, you do not. Um, so the tests that are performed from the Inspira system are tests with a high sensitivity and specificity. So as you look at the television and, and maybe on the internet and you see these tests that you can buy, some of them are about as good as a flip of a coin. Um, so the tests that we provide have a great deal of certainty that their result is accurate. Uh, so I would say you do not need a second test. Thank you, Dr. Bonner. Uh, Dr. Warner, since surgeries have restarted at Inspira, how are you keeping those surgical patients safe from your COVID positive patients? Yes, that's a good question. I could understand how people are concerned about their safety coming for an elective procedure. So we are, as you said, uh, separating our COVID patients from our non-COVID patients. So it's a separate area with separate care teams. We also have plenty of protective equipment for our staff. Um, and similarly, all of our preoperative patients are being tested before their procedure for COVID as an extra precaution uh, to assure that it, it's safe to move forward. So lots of extra steps are being taken to assess and uh, to assure that surgical patients are safe. And Dr. Warner, if you could follow up with this one, because it's along the same lines, as the number of patients with COVID decreases, will you continue to keep them away from other patients? Yes, I, I believe that we, we're we continuing to learn uh, throughout this process, but the processes we have in place now, we're confident have protected our patients, uh, as John has said, and we are gonna continue to separate our, our COVID potential and positive patients uh, from our non-COVID patients, uh, just as an extra layer of, of security. Okay. Are masks recommended outside or inside, even when six feet apart? Dr. Bonner, do you want to take that one? I would wear the mask. I think that's a great answer. I would too. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bonner, here's another really good one. I have diabetes and a heart condition, and of course these are serious conditions. Is it safe for me to visit the ER if I need to? Well, that's a great question, Alka. We, particularly for those who uh, have risks, um, the tragedy would be out of an unfounded fear if you delayed care and had a stroke because you didn't come and, and your, your stroke was completed and we couldn't intervene and help you. And then you had to live with a disability that didn't have to occur. Similarly, if, if you had chest pain, if you have heart disease, to sit at home and complete a heart attack at home and survive it and then have a cardiac disability and be functionally limited is a tragedy that doesn't have to occur. So, we, you know, the, you've heard the theme of the night is that you're safe. We want you to believe and understand that we believe you're safe. We know we're safe. And please, if you have a need, a healthcare need, feel confident that you can come and be treated and, and we'll 
take care of you and you will remain safe. Thank you, Dr. Bonner. John, this is a question we've talked about a lot and it's been asked before. Why are visitor restrictions so strict for patients who don't have coronavirus? And when will you lift the visitor restrictions? <laughs> Well, if, if I didn't know better, I think Dr. Bonner would have planted this question because he keeps asking me this question every day. And I will tell you, if it was up to me, I would allow visitors tomorrow. Uh, but the, the, the reality of this is that under the executive orders of the governor and the Department of Health, we are not allowed to have visitors. We are allowed visitors uh, for a maternity patient is allowed to have a visitor if uh, a patient requires a support person for dis if they're disabled or whatever, they can have a visitor for that. Past that, the rules as stated by the governor right now are no, we can't have any additional visiting. Because we feel that's part of the problem. There's two major problems why people, as Dr. Bonner was, was referencing, don't want to come to the ED. One, they're concerned that they might get COVID. And two, there'll be nobody there if something happens. Uh, and um, I feel very comfortable in saying that the first one is, um, should not be a concern, but the second one, people feel they want their family there, and you see on, uh, on television every night where people can't do that. That is not from us. If we had the opportunity, we would change it tomorrow. But, and we are working with the department. Um, the, uh, I'm on the board of the New Jersey Hospital Association, and we are working with the Department of Health and the Governor's Office to try to get some uh, relaxation of that policy. Thank you, John. And the next question is one I think you can ha you can uh, answer also. If I visit one of your hospitals in the coming months, what will look or what things will look or operate differently? Well, I, I think some of the things you saw you know, on the slides that uh, you wouldn't have seen prior to COVID. Uh, all the the plexiglass that we have on there, the the people at the front door making sure you have a mask on, taking your temperature, asking, asking you how you're feeling, uh, the social distancing uh, decals that we have. Um, all of those types of things are, are things you would not have seen uh, prior to COVID. Uh, but we feel that it's important for everyone to understand that uh, these are the main things that we're seeing that are helping the process. And, and you'll see a lot of that now. Um, if you go into any of our facilities. And here's another one. What is local medical community expecting to happen with COVID in the coming months, according to what we are seeing in today's science? Well, the interesting point here is, and, and I'm, I'm sure everybody saw the news over the uh, Memorial Day weekend, just like I did, uh, as restrictions get eased, how will people uh, adhere to social distancing, wearing masks, those types of things? Uh, because I will tell you, if we abandon all of those precautions, you will see a surge come back. I'm fairly certain of it. Uh, if we continue to play by the rules that have been put out, we think we'll be, um, uh, we'll be okay. Uh, you know, we, we will anticipate um, some spiking up, but we don't anticipate it will be dramatic uh, unless everybody just, you know, throws caution to the wind, and then I think you may see it. Dr. Warner, this question is going to be for you. Um, there's a couple of them, so I'll combine them, and it regards pediatric patients. So one was a patient who had asthma, and the mother is concerned that um, if she needs to, can she bring her daughter to the emergency room? And the other one was a 17-year-old who, if they need to bring the child to the emergency room, could the mom or dad be there with them because obviously they're concerned because of the limitation of visitors? Yeah, great questions. And as a parent, I, I totally understand the concerns. Uh, you want to continue to keep your, your children safe. So I would absolutely bring your children to the emergency department. We are uh, separating our pediatric patients from uh, our adult patients. And uh, likewise, parents can come back. Well, a parent can come back with uh, their child uh, to, to receive care. So as the theme of, of the evening, we would hate to have uh, an asthmatic child continue to get sicker and sicker at home and not get the care they need. So it's, it is safe to come in. You can be with your child. 
and we'll be able to separate your child from COVID patients and take care of them. Dr. Bonner, this is a good one, and I know you'll appreciate answering this one. So the question is, how long is a COVID test accurate? And if I'm tested today and the test is negative, how long can I rely on the accuracy of that test? Well, it depends on the test. Um, so if it's a high quality test with um, good science behind it and the test is negative, you can be confident that you're negative. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a fly by night uh, it, internet purchase test, I, I wouldn't trust it and it's not worth the money that you're paying. Um, and I'd like to go back to the question you asked John earlier if it would, regarding the ongoing COVID and you know the, the preparation that's occurred during this crisis management, we throughout our system have put a surge plan in and that surge plan has six levels of, of capacity, if you will. And during this episode, we've reached for a few days only our level three. That was the, the highest level of the surge plan that we had to uh, enact. Current state, most of the facilities are operating at surge one level. One of the facilities in their ICU is at surge level two. And the point to that is this COVID is going to be an ongoing process. Um, and, and we'll see if vaccines come and if treatments come. But the common sense practices need to stay in place. And the purpose for the shutdown was to give hospitals and systems time to prepare to take care of you. And that has occurred. So that even during this first wave, we never got beyond half of our capacity. And current state, we're, we're cruising along at a, at a level one at tops level two of the surge plan. So as the disease process goes forward, we have the capacity to take care of you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bonner. I personally love this question. Um, and so John, I'm gonna ask this of you. What resources are you making available for the mental health of your healthcare workers um, in this difficult time? What I tell uh, our caregivers every day is that nobody needs to go through this alone. Uh, many of our uh, employees from the standpoint of, um, you know, they may feel overwhelmed. Uh, we have a, a, a number of resources. Uh, even our, our mental health program has now started a telehealth program for our employees. So if anybody needs to talk to someone, they can talk to them. We, we have uh, EAP programs in place. Uh, we have a number of programs that we run just for our employees. And, and again, uh, everyone is open from a standpoint of saying, if you need someone to talk to, uh, please come to us. Because our goal, my goal, is to make sure that we take care of our people because, as Jim said, uh, our goal is to make sure that our folks are safe so they can keep you safe. John, here's another good one, especially since we just um, have started to do more surgeries. Um, how is Inspira deciding which elective surgery procedures to do first? Well, the, uh, the directive uh, from the commissioner, there's a little bit of guidance in there and it's sort of take the most emergent of the elective cases uh, is what they would like to see. Uh, again, we have to work with the, with the patients, we have to work with you to make sure that you're ready to, to, to have your surgery done. Uh, but from a standpoint of working with our surgeons, the goal is to determine which folks really need to be operated on first. Uh, and, and we will try to, you know, and that's how we will um, sort of prioritize them. Uh, and again, as I said earlier, we will work with our, our physicians and our clinicians because our staff has to be comfortable in doing this. Uh, but to work whatever time we need to, um, to, to get our community back on their feet and, and, for that, and to, ro to roll through that backlog. Dr. Bonner, question for you. Now that restrictions are being lifted, are you concerned that there will be another wave of COVID infections? Well, I think I, I partially answered that earlier in that I believe that this is going to be an ongoing process. It'll wax and it'll wane. Different areas will have hot, hot spots and others will cool off. 
Uh, those who weren't infected might get infected. Um, so it's going to be fluid. Um, to that end, further statement of, of preparation, um, the board just approved, you know, this negative pressure is a wonderful idea, as we've told you, but when it gets to be July, South Jersey, hot and humid, keeping the building cool and uh, dehumidified requires more HVAC. So we just spent a couple of million dollars of John's money to further enhance the capacity of the Milk Hill and Vineland buildings. So the point to that is this is going to go through the summer, this is going to go through the fall, and as it waxes and wanes, we'll be prepared. We've just um, purchased warehouse space. The ongoing acquisition of PPE, as John spoke about, will continue uh, so that we don't find ourselves in a, in a position where we might be tight on an item. Um, but current state, we're not rationing because we have enough. So the, 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 the discipline uh, that we've learned through this crisis time will keep us vigilant and, and keep us supplied as this disease runs its course. Now, and Alka, if I could, you know, I'm, I really need to say, and I got to thank my, my, my board of trustees, uh, because I will tell you from the very beginning of this, the discussions we've had at our board meetings are, we don't care what this costs, go do it. Buy the PPE, expand the, the negative pressure rooms, buy the additional HVAC to make sure that we'll be ready to go. Uh, and, and we could have shut down some of our uh, negative pressure rooms because we're not using them and we could have gotten through the summer without this being a problem. That was never part of the discussion from our board. And, and, and they're all community members and they also are all thinking about the good of our community. Thank you, John. And we've had several folks who've been asking uh, whether a recording of this presentation will be available later for viewing. And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, Dr. Warner, there's a question here asking if it's safe to have grandparents watch healthcare workers' children. And if so, are there any specific precautions that they should be taking? And that, that is a, that's a good question. Um, I would, you know, we have to be careful with our vulnerable population, our grandparents, or those with chronic um, conditions. I would say that if, you know, there is a, a smart way of going about this. Um, if you need to separate yourself as a healthcare worker from your family, it probably makes sense to have grandparents help with with watching, especially if the, your children aren't sick and the, the grandparents aren't sick, just if people are well, uh, I, I think it does make sense to have grandparents uh, assist. But I think it, there's a lot of common sense that needs to be placed there. Um, if anything that you could do to minimize exposure uh, to our vulnerable population uh, is important. However, uh, many of my colleagues you know, they, they've actually have separated themselves from their family, especially when they're in a, a stretch of, of working in the emergency department or, or in the ICU. Uh, so they need the support of their family. Uh, so as long as the children are, are, are healthy and grandparents are healthy and, you know, you have to make that decision to separate yourself from the family as a healthcare worker because you have potential exposure, um, I think that it, 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 it can happen. This just has to be you know, in a smart and common sense way. Thank you, Dr. Warner. There's a question actually that asks about end of life and can we have visitors in for end of life situations? John, would you like to answer that? Uh, actually, yes, you can. Uh, that, that is one of the exceptions um, that um, uh, from a standpoint of someone can come in and, and be um, with with their uh, uh, with their family member or their friend or whatever, uh, but past that, there's not much else. And actually, I was doing an employee town hall this morning, and somebody asked whether clergy would be able to come back. And as much as I hate to say it, clergy fall under the visitor uh, the visitation policies, and we uh, unless it's end of life, uh, we we really can't even let them back at this point. You must be telepathic, John, because there actually was a question about clergy that I was just getting ready to ask you, so that's good. 
Um, you know, we've also been getting a lot of very good comments tonight, and I'd just like to read one of them out to you because I think it does speak to what Inspira is doing overall. And thank you to the uh, viewer who sent this in. And it reads, my mother and I just returned from a 4 p.m. outpatient appointment at Inspira Mullica Hill. They took our temperature. We were normal. I thought it was smart, something that every business should be doing. And in fact, they didn't even reuse the pen that we signed in for. So thank you for your comment. It's not the only one we've got. We've gotten some great comments tonight. Uh, but again, it's very much appreciated as you listen to us. Um, John, there's questions asking about how we might have changed how we clean our facilities. Would, could you please comment on that? Well, I think we've touched on that um, uh, um, a little bit. But uh, again, the, uh, we have increased the level of, of sanitation that we use, the, the types of uh, the, the UV lighting program, the sanitation program uh, that we talked about. And, and I can tell you, we use that throughout our system. Uh, so from a standpoint of making sure that, uh, as I said, we, we also, as alcohol, do deep dives, as we call it, from a standpoint of sanitation a number of times each day. Uh, or our communal space is, is, is sanitized on an ongoing basis. And I would tell you, even in our waiting rooms, our chairs in our waiting rooms have been moved apart so that we can meet the social distancing requirements. And we are using very few of our waiting rooms these days. Uh, one of the things that uh, you know, the, uh, both Dr. Bonner and Dr. Warner uh, have implemented is, I mean, basically, if you come in, uh, the, the goal is to take you right back to a room, not have you sit. And, and if you come in, if somebody comes in with you, uh, we will ask them to wait in the car uh, or if it's the next patient and they can wait until we can bring them back. Um, so we're trying to limit the number of waiting rooms we use throughout our system as well, even our doctor's offices. Uh, if you go to one, a number of our primary care offices where we can't social distance very well, we will ask you to wait in the car. We will send a nurse or a technician out to, to take your temperature and do those things while you're in the car and then bring you back when, when, uh, uh, when we're ready. Um, so we're doing whatever we need to do in each of our locations to be able to take care of our patients. And John, I'll add to that because it was someone else who asked a question about having a colonoscopy and having a significant other who um, really was high risk and she did not want the person to come in, wanted to know if the person could stay in the car and be made aware of when the procedure was done. And the answer is absolutely yes, just as John has alluded to. That's not a problem. We've been very, very flexible. We want to make sure that safety, not just for the patient, but also their loved ones is paramount. Uh, John, this is a very uh, interesting question. Did Inspira receive any federal um, stimulus money? And if so, what did you use it for? Well, there's actually been two tranches of money that have been uh, distributed. In, in the first tranche, we received about $11 million. And all of that money was used for uh, the PPE supplies that uh, uh, that we've continued to purchase. Uh, the second tranche, we did not get anything. We were only one of three hospitals in in the south in in, in the south of New Jersey uh, that did not get a distribution. And and we are working with Congressman Van Drew's office and um, uh, Health and Human Services Department to see uh, if there is a way that we can get access uh, to to that money. But as of this point. We have only received one distribution, and we have used it all for uh, uh, additional COVID supplies and expenses. Here's a question about current treatment. One of the viewers wants to know what the current treatment is that we're using for COVID patients. Dr. Bonner? Thank you, Alka. So it's a broad spectrum of, of options. Um, the, you know, the hydroxychloroquine had its play uh, along with the uh, Zithromax. Uh, remdesivir is available to us. Uh, plasma therapy is available to us throughout the system. Uh, most of these folks are treated with supportive care and oxygenation, whether that be with a mask or high flow or intubation. Um, so in the beginning, it was coached to intubate these patients early if they were in trouble. And then we realized that as the disease progressed, we couldn't get those folks off the ventilator. They'd be on the ventilator for two weeks, three weeks. And, uh, you know, that, that has its own consequences. So 
pr amazingly proning the patient. So having the patient lay on their stomach allows for different parts of the lung to work and has enhanced the oxygenation. So many patients have not had to get intubated with the simple practice of proning. So there's a, a, a wide variety of treatment options and the uh, in intensivists in, in the, you know, the ICUs are, are spectacular at what they do. And uh, that, I guess that's, that's what I know at this point. Well, and j just to add to that, Jim, um, on the plasma treatment, we were one of the early hospitals to um, participate with the Mayo Clinic uh, in the research trials that they did on the uh, um, uh, plasma program and uh, on the remdesivir uh, that Jim had mentioned, which seems to be working. And of course, whenever something works, um, they've uh, given us throughout the state. The state decides who gets uh, that drug now, and there's very little of it available to anybody in the state. So they're trying very hard. And it's not only the United States, it's the whole world that the, the company is making the drug for. And there's just not a lot there to be had right now. So unfortunately, we are running very close to the end of our hour. And I am sorry because there are so many questions that we're not going to be able to get to all of them tonight. We will figure out some way of getting these out um, and answered because they're all really good questions. I just simply can't get through all of them. I'm going to read one last comment and then I'm going to turn it back to John for some closing statements. Um, one of the viewers has written in, thank you everyone for doing this briefing. It was very good and informative. I heard many people say they're afraid to go to the hospital. And it's also nice to hear a local voice instead of a state one. And with that, John, I'll toss it back to you for some final comments. Well, again, I want to thank you all for hanging in there. Um, this was, this is the first community event that we've done. We do this with our employees now all the time. One of the big changes that we've had is the majority of our meetings are now done um, using Zoom or, or these virtual types of uh, ways of doing it. Uh, but uh, again, our goal is to make sure that you know that you are safe if you come to us. We are here to take care of you and here to help no matter how you need it. Uh, we've, our goal has always been to make it as easy as possible for you to, to come to Inspira if you need help. So again, thank you all for participating. And all I can say is please take care of yourself and be healthy. Thank you. <laughs>